This webinar has been organised in collaboration with Foam in Imaging Australia and Microscopy oh. Australia, and we're going to be featuring Dr. Chris Hall, who's joining us. Um, Dr. Hall's the key member of a small team responsible for managing a world-class biomedical and materials imaging facility at the Australian Synchrotron, and he's going to be sharing his insights into the current capabilities of the volume imaging at this facility, but also discussing the early plans for a new machine. So we really encourage you to share your questions and engage in discussion throughout this presentation. So you can post questions in the chat um, or wait for the Q&A session at the end. Um, and without further ado, hopefully, Let's get going over to Dr. Well, Hall. Okay, so um, thanks very much for inviting me to talk to you today because, uh, I mean, the main reason for this is really to uh, inform you and ask you about what you would like uh, from a synchrotron in Australia here uh, in 10 or 15 years' time. So I'm not going to assume that the, the audience here knows much about synchrotron, so there's a little bit of a introduction to the synchrotron and what it does and the sort of um, microscopies and volume imaging that we do on the synchrotron. And then um, the imaging techniques that we use, of which there are many, of course, uh, which uh, are probably the most interesting thing to you guys using photons. Uh, there'll be a focus on the tomographies that we do at the moment uh, on my beamline and our next door beamline. Uh, and then uh, the main... Uh, idea behind this meeting is to inform you of to, as to what might be happening in the future and to get your feedback as to what you might want from a machine uh, like a synchrotron or even actually a synchrotron um, in uh, 2035. So um, for those of you who don't know, I'm not going to assume that everybody knows what a synchrotron is. Um, in fact, well, it's, it's, uh, the synchrotron is short for a synchrotron storage ring and there are several of them around the world. Um, the one in Melbourne here is only one of two in the Southern Hemisphere, the other one being in Brazil. Uh, and they're very useful uh, devices for producing beams of photons for doing experiments, and particularly the sort of thing that we're interested in, which is volume imaging. Um, and the, the Australian synchrotron has been around for a while. Um, the original call from actually the federal government was back in the early 2000s to, to build a synchrotron somewhere in Australia. In fact, uh, Victoria kind of gazumped the process a bit and decided that it was going to be in here here in Melbourne. For those of you in Brisbane, unfortunately, you've missed out because that was the second favourite place. <laughs> um, and it's it's been going gangbusters since then. So you can see from the bottom line there that um, since November in 2009, we've had uh, an almost world record beating uptime on the synchrotron, producing these lovely beams of, of photons that we can use for our experiments. Um, the basic idea is that we take an electron um, in the uh, storage ring injector here. Let me just put the, the uh, uh, laser pointer up. So, whoops, let me go back up the slide. Uh, <clears throat> so this, this bit here is the, the start of the electron's journey. It starts in a linear accelerator. It goes into the only bit of this accelerator complex, which is really a synchrotron, which is this middle bit here we call the booster ring. And then once it's accelerated up to the final velocity, it stays in this outer ring, the storage ring, all day long. And it, every time it goes through one of these block, these magnet blocks here, it produces a beam of light, and that's what we use for our experiments. And the energy it loses through the photons that it produces are topped up by um, microwaves. Um, there's, there's a couple of cavities around here which are actually not shown particularly well on this diagram, but uh, we use a um, half a megawatt uh, Klystron to keep the, uh, the electrons uh, going. And the result of that, this is a picture of the inside of that storage ring there, is that when it goes through these yellow dipole magnets, and also in magnets that are set between those dipole magnets as well, it produces beams of light which come off at a tangent to the electron's path. And of course, the electron is bent by the magnetic field away from the photon beam. And I thought I'd just put up this, uh, uh, sorry for... Uh, being a little bit childish here, but this is one of Anstow's um, plastic rulers that we give out to the school kids, which shows you the, um, the wavelengths of light here. And of course, that the emission from the synchrotron is pretty much all the way across uh, this spectrum here, all the way from um, infrared and even lower out to, um, to the X-rays. But it's the X-ray end of the spectrum that we're most interested in because it's uh, quite difficult to produce bright beams of X-rays efficiently uh, if you don't use these type of acceleration techniques. So the electrons, this, this little thing works here. Uh, the electrons start their path going through the, uh, the dipoles there and produce these little beams of light. 
and then we pull off the, the beams are actually really beams because the electrons are relativistic and so the um the, the light comes off genuinely near beam all of the energy comes out in the forward direction so that makes it a, a very efficient producer of, of photons and then we peel that beam off towards the uh, experiments uh, which are obviously in radiation proof enclosures which we call hutches so if I, if I say hutches throughout the torch talk that's uh, what I'm meaning and uh, that's where all of the experiments done and on the Australian synchrotron we've got uh, upwards of 15 of these type of um, of hutches and uh, an experimental uh, uh, instruments. So looking at the way that uh, photons interact, you can see from this wonderful diagram, which I love to use here because it shows pretty much everything that happens when you shine x-rays on, on materials. All of these uh, phenomena can be used for imaging and or volume imaging. Um, the ones that we're uh, particularly interested in, of course, are these transmitted photons here, which is your basic radiography. So does it get through the material or not? And you produce a, an image uh, based on that absorption. But all of these other techniques, um, some of which are not, uh, I'm not going to talk about because they're not really real space imaging. They're, they're Fourier space imaging. Um, and so that's kind of outside the remit of this talk. But even those can be turned into tomographic uh, volume imaging techniques if you want to. Um, so I'm going to start off by looking at stuff from our beamline, which is the imaging and medical beamline on the Australian synchrotron. We've got um, basically two modes of operation, uh, a mode which uses the, the hutches that are inside the synchrotron building, close to the source, very high dose, um, not particularly great for some of the techniques I'm going to talk about, but if, for others, it's really good. Um, and we do also do radiotherapy and radiobiology in that area as well, which, again, I'm not going to talk about today. But um, if you're interested, just uh, give me a, an email. But the main um, the hutch for our primary imaging is, is out here, away from the synchrotron building, at about 140 metres from the source. And the reason we do that is because the beam is divergent, even though I said you know it's um, a relativistic photon. A, uh, photons from a relativistic electron beam. It is divergent, and by the time it gets 140 meters away, we're into an enclosure which is quite large. Um, quite a this um, piece of apparatus at the back here is our primary. Uh, sorry, the, the final slits for the photon beam, which can be up to uh, half a meter wide. Um, it's not particularly high uh, in, in its natural state because of the way that synchrotron radiation is produced from the electron. So it's only about three centimetres high. But we do have ways of putting optics in the beam to make it higher. And the other apparatus you can see around here is, um, are basically sample manipulation apparatus and the detectors. So this table at the back here contains all of the X-ray detectors that we use. Um, this stack in front of us here is the um, rotation table that allows us to spin the samples whilst we're collecting the, uh, the projection images for, the, for our computed tomograms. And of course, we can't move the synchrotron beam, so we have to move the sample. And that includes uh, something that I'll allude to towards the end of the talk, which is this robot arm that hangs from the ceiling here. We have actually been asked uh, or sponsored by the NH and MRC to do clinical imaging with this device. So we will be doing human radiography uh, and computed tomography uh, using these this devices here uh, hopefully before the end of the year so uh, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that more towards the uh, in, in a couple of slides time actually yeah so we're good at doing large objects the uh, the IMBL is the uh, the pre premier beam uh, beam line that you would want to do if you wanted to look Look at the uh, head of a shark, for instance. So this is a very interesting project uh, run primarily by Monash University, but um, also a, a collaboration of others, looking at the development of the jaw muscles in the shark. So this is a surface rendering from a computed tomogram that we took of a, a great white. Um, and the, uh, the, the real scientific interest, of course, is in the, the, the muscles. You can see here that the, the image starts to get a little bit noisy uh, towards the thick part of his, the bottom of his head there because we were punching through about uh, 60 centimetres of muscle uh, to, to get this image. But even so, you know, the, the beam uh, from the IMBL is strong enough, is energetic enough to punch through that to get a reasonably good image uh, of the, uh, the musculature around here. And of course, the idea is that these uh, great whites, when they're young, actually are not 
particularly dangerous to us because they're, pro they're primarily eating fish. But as they grow up uh, and their jaws and their muscles develop, they start um, chewing on seals, and that's when they start becoming a problem for our surfers. And here is the, uh, the, the clinical uh, apparatus that we're going to be using for the, um, the first clinical program that we're doing on IMBL. And that has been chosen by our clinical colleagues to be mammography. Uh, the idea here is that we can take um, volume images, CTs, of the human breast uh, with the same radiation dose that you would get from a screening mammogram, uh, but obviously in 3D. And that, that extra information is really useful for the clinicians to diagnose early the uh, any potential disease states in the breast. And also to allow younger women who have uh, more uh, dense breasts to, to, to go for a screening. We don't propose that they come to the synchrotron to do this, but we are investigating this technique so that we can inform industry how they might do it in a machine that would um, that be affordable and the right size to go into a hospital. And that's the subject of a, a, a big grant that we've got from the NHMRC called IMPACT, if you wanted to Google that. Um, and the clinical part of that is driven by Sydney University. And the results, um, this is just a, a, an image of a mastectomy sample. So we've been very uh, lucky in being able to intercept tissues that come from the surgery in a couple of hospitals in Melbourne here before they go to the pathology department. And during that interception, we will scan them uh, using our, our techniques on the beamline here and uh, produce um, images which we show to the radio radiologists and say, is this better than the standard image? And of course, most of the time the answer is yes. So I apologize for the, the low level of science in this, but um, I, I wanted to get on to, to the main part of the story. Um, but if you're interested in any of this stuff, first of all, have a look at the IMPACT website, and secondly, uh, give me an email. Next door to us is a fairly new beamline. It's only eight, just over 18 months old now, uh, which does a uh, much better resolution uh, computed tomography and this is the uh, the first experiment we did uh, on the micro CT beam line back in October in 2022. Uh, some of you may re uh, recognize some of the characters in this picture here and as I say it's, it's, it's right next door to us and the nice thing is about uh, MCT is it fits between our size, our feature size and resolution on the IMBL here and the feature size and resolution which uh, both MCT and another beamline that we're building on the synchrotron here will fit. So micro CT is, is, um, has you know, resolutions ten, uh, 1 to 10 microns and sort of centimeter size objects. So the example that uh, Andrew Stevenson's provided for me here is of a, of a tree. So IMBL can look at the stem of the tree, the, uh, the, the trunk and also at the root and soil interaction. And these are experiments that we've actually done uh, with Sydney Uni uh, with you know, objects the size of a few centimetres. MCT will then go down into, uh, the, into the hierarchy, into the structural hierarchy of the, of the wood and look down to the cellular level where you can see 100 micron uh, and much lower size features. And then MCT also has a nano... Um, uh, imaging capability on it, which is not quite ready to go yet, but will be very soon. And that will take you down, as I say, to the sort of uh, 1 to 10 micron level. And, and all of this, of course, in, in computed tomograms. And hopefully, uh, with a, within a very uh, short number of months, we will have a yet another beamline that will go down even lower, uh, even better resolution than that. So MCT has a number of different modes, a number of different ways of using it. They can use a, um, a broad spectrum, which we, in the synchron world we call it white, but it's not really white. It's just a broad spectrum of X-ray wavelengths. Or they can monochromate with a fairly wide uh, band pass compared to IBL. Or they can monochromate and, and remove some of the, uh, uh, the additional uh, wavelengths with a mirror. Um, and all of this with some very fine, highly engineered um, rotation goniometry equipment uh, to do either you, you step, take a picture and uh, move on. Uh, you can continually rotate and trigger the detector to uh, take the images, the projection images on the fly. Helical scanning, 
uh, time of synthesis where you're only taking a limited number of ang a limited angle of projections in order to create a, a pseudo computed tomogram and laminography where you have a, a flat plate like object which um, I think many of you know will not be uh, really great for doing the standard CT so there's a different way of doing uh, those type of shapes um, they've got a number of different detectors um, and the high speed detector is thousands of frames a second so potentially we could do uh, computed thermograms in a, a second or less on this, on this device and we have our own of course a lot of this uh, relies on information technology and computers so we have a local storage facility and our local uh, compute cluster to allow you to um, look at the, the images when you're on the beam line taking the, taking the pictures. This is a, a, a plan view of the MCT beam line, just showing the optics hutch here. Uh, they've got two experimental hutches with one uh, which has got a, an automated sample uh, exchange robot in it, which I'll show you in a second. And another one which is used for the nano CT detector with the nano CT optics being this hutch. And the, uh, there's some other very interesting uh, ways of using the, uh, the, the beauty of the, of the um, X-ray beam from the synchrotron, which uh, I won't go into in great detail here, but um, it's basically a phase contrast technique but without using the, uh, the natural um, phase uh, information from the beam. Here's a picture of their robot, so you can get a lot of samples through this in a, in a short period of time, the robot, and they have all of the usual equipment here for manipulating the samples and uh, measuring the beam and normalizing it. And here's a couple of results. So the very first picture I think Andrew took was of a uh, slater that happened to wander across the floor, um, or at least it probably didn't wander because I think it was deceased by the time he got it but just to show you the, uh, the the detail that you can get in the in, in these mct images uh, and you might notice that there are there's a sort of black and white fringing around these um density changes in the uh, carapace of the of the slater here and that's due to something that so i won't go into in great detail but it's a, a unique um aspect of a synchrotron beam is that the beam is quite coherent and so when you have changes in density you actually get a, a refractive effect uh, due to those density changes in the tissue here which causes uh, a physical edge enhancement but also if you put that into a computer you can then get some exquisite um, grayscale changes which are very much more sensitive to density than uh, just plain old absorption. And of course, I couldn't get away without doing some CT, so I'm not sure whether these are going to spin. No, they're not. But uh, if, if they were spinning, you could see that these were computed tomograms of a, of a piece of uh, a toothpick and, uh, and a, another insect here, which were um, taken very early on in the, uh, uh, in the beam, beam line's uh, history. Of course, this, this beam line is now open for business, and it has been, for, as I say, for a long while. So if you're interested in this sort of resolution, you can get... Um, Specimens in there up to, as I say, a centimetre or so, uh, but with really fine resolution. Moving along to a different technique now. This is the, um, I, th I think many of you will know this, this idea that when an X-ray beam hits uh, materials with, with elements in them, they uh, give off a characteristic X-ray as a fluorescence. And we have a beam line which can detect that uh, fluorescence uh, uh, emission very, very um, well. It's arguably one of the best beam lines in the world for doing this. So um, the only elements that we can't actually reach with this beam line are the ones, the very light ones in the shaded area here. But all of the rest of them, we can uh, shine a beam on the sample, look at the characteristic X-rays from these elements, and actually um, quantify the amount of elements in the sample using these fluorescence uh, X-rays. The, uh, the beam reaches 27 keV, which is not a great uh, penetration power for some very heavy element materials. Um, but even if you don't, if you're not able to penetrate completely into the material, you can still produce a volume image of a computed tomogram using this technique. So what they do is um, they've got uh, two or three different ways of, of um, bringing the beam down onto the sample. This is for the soft X-rays here where you can use zone plate objectives, um, a bit like uh, X-ray microscopy, to focus the beam down onto the sample. Then you, then you 
basically just raster scan the sample through the beam. And whilst you're doing that, you're picking up the fluorescence uh, from the detector off to the side. Actually, it's not off to the side. I'll show you in the next slide. It's, it's uh, coaxial with the beam. Uh, and then a transmission detector as well, which can give you some very interesting other types of imaging, uh, which, which uh, you can do at the same time. Uh, those of you who don't know, Zane's is X-ray absorption near edge structure. So you can actually look at the sort of atomic level details of the um, elements that you're getting the fluorescence from down there. Um, and at the moment, it's only the it's our only hard X-ray. When I say hard, up to, to well, 25 to 27 kV uh, uh, microprobe beamline. Uh, but the other one that I'm going to talk about soon is, is, is very close to being open as well. So you can see the resolutions here are sort of one micron um, for, the, for the micro probe. But they can also do things like looking at paintings here. So this, this painting was a, a, almost a meter square. Uh, with the milli probe, if they um, just use focusing mirrors rather than that stone plate object uh, objective to, to produce a, a larger spot on the sample, you can scan quite large things over a reasonable period of time. I think it took several hours to do this, this painting. But when you do it, of course, you can look at the painting with the light from zinc, cobalt, and manganese. So that obviously, if it's a painting, you can determine to a certain extent what the uh, pigments were that were, the artist was using. OK, so uh, I had to show you this wonderful image, which is one of my I mean, they, they, the, the beauty of XFM is that they do, do produce some extra, extremely gorgeous images. So this is a picture of a tadpole uh, with the zinc, selenium, and the sulfur highlighted. Um, of course, it was a serious scientific problem that the tadpoles were living in selenium-polluted water. And in fact, you can see the, the, the buildup of selenium around the retina here was causing the poor guys to go blind. But it's just a stunning image. And of course, um, they can uh, falsely color all sorts of things like this. It's good, isn't it? Yeah. And here we are. Here's the tomograph tomography done from, from that beam line. This is um, manganese fluorescence uh, from a seed that was um, an archaeological uh, seed. Uh, just to show you that you don't need to penetrate all the way down through the object in order to get um, a, uh, a shell-like computed tom tomogram from these uh, objects like this. Okay, so one of the things that the synchron is very good at is phase contrast with x-rays. And I'm just going to briefly explain that because um, it's something that if you're just using x-ray sets in, say, the clinic, you wouldn't be aware of. The fact that the uh, um, x-rays wavelengths as a complex reflect refractive index, which includes quite a large phase shift. Uh, in fact, the phase shift is about a thousand times more sensitive to the density, the electron density in the material that you're looking at than absorption. So potentially it's got a really good advantage over just absorption image. And of course the synchrotron being a, um, a, a highly efficient and the, the electrons are, are moving through a vacuum. So it's, it's, it's not only highly efficient, but the, the electron source size is very small, the coherence, that, that is the amount of um, the, the, the lateral coherence, which is the width over which the x-rays can be considered in step, is quite large, 30 microns. Um, and in fact, uh, as I will tell you in the not too distant future, we can go even better than that. <laughs> so um, what do we use the phase contrast for? We, there are various optical techniques where you can exploit the phase contrast to produce grayscale, as I say, which is much more sensitive to density change than absorption. But there are other ways of using that coherence, uh, which uh, can also be turned into tomographies called um, dark field imaging and speckle imaging. Um, one of the, I said we wouldn't go into Fourier space, but one of the really neat imaging techniques that we can do with the synchrotron is uh, actually use the, um, the Fourier space uh, representation of an image to do kind of like holography. Um, and coherent diffractive image, imaging is one of these techniques. So we take a zone plate, focus the beam down, allow it to, uh, to start to diverge again. And then we put the sample in the way and look at the, uh, dif the diffraction pattern from that sample with a detector that's placed at some distance away. And what we, we're recording then is a, is a diffraction pattern of that object, so the, basically the Fourier space representation of the object. And then there are some very fancy algorithms that can be used to turn that back into the real space structure of the object. 
And of course, the beauty of this is that we're not now limited by the wavelength of the X-rays, but uh, the, because the the, uh, the object is act, acting uh, like a lens, it's a lensless form of imaging. Uh, and this technique has been done uh, somewhat on the, on the Australian synchrotron, but a lot more on the American synchrotron, where David Vine, who used to work at Monash Uni, um, is now uh, doing a lot of this work. Um, so you can imagine that you can do that um, that one image, and then of course you can turn it uh, into tomography. Um, the the uh, the original CDI has a limited field of view, so it's not uh, particularly great for extended objects. But of course you can do the same trick that you, you do with the fluorescence microscopy and just scan the object um, over the sample, uh, sc scan the sorry the object through the beam. Uh, the, the beam through the sample and collect a lot of diffraction patterns. They have to be fairly well, significantly overlapped in order to uh, be able to run the uh, reconstruction algorithm behind them. But it's not too difficult to do. And of course, um, the modern um, technology and, and IT allows us to do some really wonderful things like this uh, with, with a reasonable time period. And so here's an example of, a, of a, what we call tychography, which is this technique of, of stepping and, and shooting the uh, diffraction pattern across a, uh, an object. Uh, and this time, of course, it's done on the XFM beamline, so you can actually get fluorescence tychography. So each of these images is uh, representing the fluorescence from a different uh, element, and it's, uh, it's collected using the tychographic technique with spatial resolutions that are better than 0.1 micron. And of course, the, uh, the the big hairy goal is then to collect a whole bunch of these diffraction patterns at a different uh, rotation angle, at a different like, what we call a projection angle, and then reconstruct them in 3D. Now, originally, of course, people thought this was going to be very difficult, if not impossible, because it would take so long. Every uh, set, every sample that you put in this technique has about you know 100,000 uh, diffraction patterns, which you're going to be, need to uh, to reconstruct. But as I say, the, the computing technology has come on so far now that is that uh, this is actually now feasible, especially if you've got a synchrotron. So that, that uh, all of those ideas have now been extended to a new beamline, which actually extends XFM uh, quite a lot. Uh, the beamline is this is the IMBL where I'm sitting at the moment here, and uh, uh, MCT is is inside the. Uh, the main experimental hall. The next one along, which comes outside the experimental hall, is called the nanoprobe beamline. And as of two weeks ago, the construction on this building is finished. Uh, as of Friday, the road is now open across the around the ring here. So it's getting close to, uh, um, I believe, its first light is supposed to be uh, before the end of this year. And this is going to be a, a, a very exciting beamline. Uh, it's got three uh, hutches, two end stations, um, and a secondary source hutch um, with uh, everything designed to do a factor of 10 better resolution than the XFM beam line. So it, it'll be able to map uh, elements that are heavier than silicon. It'll be able to do all of those um, tychographic and scanning and transmission type micrographies that I've uh, talked about for XFM. And it's designed to do tomography, so volume imaging, for all of these contrast methods. The, uh, the engineering has been done in-house here for some, some really fancy bits of equipment because, of course, everything needs to be incredibly stable to work down at the sort of resolution uh, limits that they're approaching here, which is of the order of 10 to 50 nanometers. So it really is a microscopy, uh, uh, X-ray microscopy technique. They've also got a, a robot. Uh, again, this was inspired by um, other uh, synchrotrons around the world, but... Uh, designed by us, with a, um, a, a spatial resolution of five nanometers RMS. So it's, it's really quite a, a, an intricate piece of equipment for, for moving the sample around. But I say that the, the, uh, the idea of this talk was really to introduce you to a brand new idea um, that this synchrotron is now over 15 years old. Typically, the lifetime of a synchrotron is about 30 years. So we should start now thinking about what's next. What, what are we going to do next? And in fact, next week, uh, the guys from the uh, machine physics group here 
have designed a lattice for a new synchrotron for Australia, and they're presenting it at the, the world's um, biggest particle physics conference, which is taking place in Nashville this year. Um, and so I'm just going to run you through that and, and uh, give you an idea of what might be planned for the future. So the four, we call it the fourth generation synchrotron because it's 10 times better than the third generation synchrotron. That's the sort of uh, the, the, the measure of, a, of a, when you change generation, generations. The idea is it's going to be about twice the size of the, the one we have in Clayton here at the moment. At the moment, the electron energy is going to be the same, but the electron current is going to be double uh, the existing synchrotron. And because it's so much larger, we're going to have a lot more potential for beam lines, 20 bending magnets and about 20 to 22 insertion devices. But the key thing for a lot of people is that this uh, thing that they call the emittance here, which is the size of the source and the uh, angle at, at which the photons come off that source. And that is at least 10 times, I think, maybe even more better than the one that we have here. And it's approaching the absolute limit at which you can... Uh, you can do for these synchrotrons. So it's going to be a lot brighter. Uh, the first question that everybody asks me when I present this is, oh, where's it going to be then? Well, of course, that's the last question that will be answered because it's a very political one. But as I say, you guys in Brisbane, you can, uh, you can keep your eyes open. And then the other um, thing is that they haven't ruled out. I vote for Brisbane. Okay. Um, Daniel, who's sitting next to me, votes for Brisbane. It's a lot warmer than it is here at the moment. Um, so the other possibility is a linear type accelerator, which we call the free electron laser. Um, at the moment, that, that has a, a very specialist application, and only a few people are really keen on that. There are, there are some of these already around the world, in Germany and in America and Japan. But uh, uh, we could have one in Australia if you so desire. So I've just made this very a bit uh, busy slide here, but if you look at the, the far right, you'll see the, the factors of improvement of the proposed AS2, which is this new machine, against the one that we have at the moment. So actually it's 200 times the emittance, yeah, that's right. Uh, a much smaller source size in the, in the dipole magnets, uh, and it's similar smaller source size in the straight sections, double the ring circumference, which means a lot more beam lines, at the moment, for uh, the people who work like I do in the sort of um, larger object type imaging, it's a bit disappointing that the energy of the electrons is still 3 GV because the, um, the photon energy goes up quite dramatically as you increase the electron energy. Um, so we are going to be lobbying for 3.5 GV energy from our group here, um, uh, which may actually compromise some of the... Uh, capabilities at lower energies, but we'll, we'll make that a little bit of a fight, I think. Um, and yes, as I say, the ring current will be about double. And for, for those of you who worry about time resolve stuff, uh, the bunch length, which is um, the, the pulsing nature of the synchrotron, will be about a factor of four better. So we're moving from, in this graph of the circumference versus the uh, emittance here, we're moving from the uh, top left there down into the middle. Um, and all of these other synchrotrons here, um, uh, most of them, or yes, I think all of them actually exist now, and some of them are a lot bigger than us, but our uh, emittance is going to be com uh, com in competition with some of those machines if we build this machine in the way that we uh, are proposing at the moment. So what's happening is that this initiative is coming primarily from the synchrotron here in Melbourne. Um, at the moment, we're just going to do, we've done community surveys to see whether there's an appetite for such a machine or not. We've set up some working groups to try and gather information about what uh, we might do with this new machine. Uh, there will be a workshop coming up very soon, maybe next month, but perhaps a little bit longer, to uh, discuss all of this information that we've gathered uh, with the idea that we can engage with the stakeholders and other people who may be paying for this um, sometime in the next financial year. So the, the working groups at the moment, they, they've divided us into uh, uh, eight uh, groups. So if you're interested in any of these, um, I, I will attempt to make this slide available to you because um, it's useful to contact 
either the, the internal people are on the second line on these slides for these different groups, and the external uh, champions are on the top line here. So you can see, for instance, in the X-ray imaging methods group here, Sherry Mayo from the CSRO is our champion um, externally, and uh, I'm the, uh, the internal synchron person. But yep, the, the working bee, that's right. Um, so diffraction, crystallography, small angle scattering, and then the others are coherence methods. So this is the one that's going to may interest a lot of you guys in, in microscopy, uh, which is the, these very fine resolution X-ray techniques. Absorption spectroscopy um, and infrared and photo uh, emission. So that's the softer X-ray end of things down here. So it's those eight groups that are collecting all this information. So thank you very much for your uh, attention. I apologize for the... Um, the, the, uh, the little bit of a hiccup we had for a start. But if you can, uh, if you have any interest at all in this, um, the general inquiries email is there, just inquiries AS2, ANSTO. Uh, and then Sherry and myself uh, will be very happy to get any feedback uh, from you guys about uh, any of this stuff. So thanks again.